Welcome everyone. It's Grand Rounds time again. We are fortunate to have Jason R. Kilmer, PhD, Research Assistant Professor in Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. He's Assistant Director of Health and Wellness for Alcohol and Other Drug Education, Division of Student Life Chairperson, uh, and oh, Division of Student Life, and he's the Chairperson for the College Coalition for Substance Abuse Prevention. Dr. Kilmer received his PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Washington in 1997 and currently works at the university in both the student affairs and research capacity. Dr. Uh, Dr. Kilmer serves as an investigator on several studies evaluating prevention uh, and intervention efforts for alcohol and other drug use by college students. He is also the assistant director of health and wellness for alcohol and other drug education in the vision of student life, working with different areas across campus, including health, counseling, Greek life, residence life, and athletics, to increase student access to evidence-based approaches. Dr. Kilmer, thank you for coming Great, to speak with us, much. and welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me first say thank you to all. There's so many people here from uh, the Center for the Study of Health and Risk Behaviors. I appreciate you guys being here. And thanks to everyone for uh, taking your time out of your, out of your Friday uh, to be a part of this. Um, this is a topic that I'm so passionate about because um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I get the chance to try and do exactly this. My title is, is Bridging the Gap Between Research and Practice, Impacting College Student Substance Use. Um, I wanted to spend ever so slight a moment just to talk a bit about what I do at the University of Washington. Um, in psychiatry and behavioral sciences, I um, have the true honor of being part of a team that um, for years, are, are among a range of other health and risk behaviors, has conducted research on college student drinking, marijuana use, other drug use, but I think importantly prevention and intervention responses in, uh, in, uh, in response to these issues. Um, part of what I've done has also been assisting in the development of some of the feedback that we've done. Um, in personalized feedback interventions to reduce substance-related harms. In health and wellness, which is in the division of student life, uh, a lot of that involves trying to put uh, what the science says matters in the hands of the ones that could be delivering these types of things. So I provide trainings on the evidence-based approaches, many of which have come out of our own lab, uh, to those who provide clinical services on campus, uh, help to translate not only research trends, but research findings to student life colleagues who directly work with students. And that includes everything from uh, again, what current health issues are, current challenges, but uh, with so many big policy changes in the state of Washington, even, even looking at some of those kind of issues. Uh, and then I personally do direct work with students on the UW campus as well. To me, the, the ability to work half-time in psychiatry, half-time in student life, it provides the opportunity for the interventions that we develop to really be informed by the current things college students are dealing with, um, the relevant issues, the relevant challenges. Plus, it gives us a chance to test how these things work or maybe don't work as well in the real world. Um, I think there's the chance to help promote very rapid dissemination and implementation of new approaches. Um, if we have something that we think seems like a promising practice, uh, I'm able to help get that hands of students within days. Um, plus, you know, for our campus and university that talks so much about the value, certainly, of a scientist practitioner approach, I feel lucky uh, that I get to do that. Uh, it very much sets the stage for being able to implement those things. So over the course of uh, this lunch hour, um, the objectives for today were to talk a bit about what are, in quotes, the tier one interventions, the ones with the most evidence for reducing college student drinking and consequences, uh, identify the barriers to implementing those evidence-based approaches, and then finally looking at strategies for increasing access to these things. Um, I wanted to start a bit just by talking about some of the things we see around college student drinking. I'm going to start by showing you a sign that um, I kind of feel bad showing because I feel like I'm making fun of the person that made it, but, um, and that's not the intent, but um, you know when you're, if you're advertising for something, if you leave out a single word, it fundamentally changes what you're trying to make clear. I had the honor of being the opening presenter at a conference that Duke University was holding on um, college student drinking and drug use prevention, and when we got to the North Carolina area, uh, it was pretty clear that some people weren't so thrilled we were there, and we weren't entirely clear why until we got to campus. In all the parking lots surrounding the conference center, uh, the lots were closed off with the following sign. Lot reserved for, drinking, for, for, uh, for college student drinking and drug use, uh, May 18th and 19th, 2010. 
obviously the sign maker left off the word conference or meeting or anything that would have made that look a little less creepy to people walking by. Um, you got to figure some guy walking his dog was like, well, at least they're cutting those kids off at five. That's, that's good, but having them start at eight, it's pretty early, Duke people. Um, when you look at data from the Monitoring the Future study, just to get a sense of what we see nationally, um, Monitoring the Future has collected data from 8th graders, 10th graders, 12th graders, college students, and young adults not in college for the last 30 plus years. Um, the most recent survey showed that 77% of college students say that they've consumed alcohol at least once in the past year. To me, there's two important things to draw from that. First, 23% of students don't drink. And whether that's because they're in recovery, whether that's because they're abstainers and lifelong abstainers, or maybe they've tried it and we still don't know where their use might ultimately go, these 23% are still an important target of prevention efforts. The other thing we conclude is that 77% of students aren't over the age of 21. So we do know that there's some underage students who make the choice to drink. 60% say they've been drunk at least once in the past year. About two-thirds, if you shrink the time frame to past month, report any alcohol use. And under half, 40%, report that they've been drunk at least once in the past month. Um, we know that this is not without consequences for students. Um, from the National College Health Assessment, uh, students at 141 campuses, among those who do drink, when the past 12 months, primary consequence students endorse doing or saying something they later regretted. To me, what's important is that this is a consequence that has that notion of regret in it. A lot of consequence measures often get criticized because they're, in quotes, negative consequences as defined by the researcher. So we'll say, you know, well, the student threw up. That's a negative consequence. Some students are like, I thought it was funny. Or, you know, everybody throws up. That's not, that comes with the territory. The fact that students say, I did something I later regretted, does imply there's a, there's a window of opportunity for some of the interventions we might try. 34% reported blacking out, 20% had unprotected sex, and 17% physically injured themselves, again, as a consequence of drinking. Other drugs are definitely being used. 36% say they've uh, used an illicit drug at least once in the past year. If you just ask about marijuana, 33% say they've smoked weed in the last year. That is much greater than the 25% report past your use of tobacco cigarettes. So that we've done a great job about warning people about the dangers of tobacco. We've miffed, missed an opportunity for substances like marijuana, or maybe the truth is somewhere in between. Uh, if you dump marijuana from the equation, 16.8% report past your use of any other illicit substance. Obviously, the 33.2 plus 16.8 doesn't equal the 36.3. That's because we see poly substance use as well. Some students report use of marijuana also report use of other substances. Uh, just to arbitrarily draw a line at 5% out of the 40 plus drugs they assess, these were the five most frequently endorsed substances other than uh, marijuana. Adderall for non-medical reasons by about one in 10 students. Other amphetamines by 9%. Synthetic marijuana, K2 or spice. Um, has that number gone up or down? We don't know. That was the first year they included that. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. 6.2% narcotics other than heroin. Why is it worded that way? Because on the survey it says heroin, right below it, narcotics other than heroin. And then Vicodin, again, for, for non-medical reasons as well. Um, what I think is important is so often people say, well, is this a worthwhile population to be working with? These are college students. Um, college students, we have seen the literature show time and time again, are, um, as our student, body get more, student bodies across the country get more diverse, um, and as we see trends within the general population, I'm starting to match what we see on college campuses. Um, a study came out looking at the uh, National Epidemiological Study of Alcohol-Related Conditions that showed that almost half of college students met past year prevalence of any Axis I psychi psychiatric disorder, personality disorder, or substance use disorder. About one in five meet criteria for a substance use disorder, 18% personality disorders, 12% anxiety disorders, 11% mood disorders, and certainly these can co-occur. I think why this certainly is an important topic as well is anything we do around drinking prevention also pays dividends in the classroom. There's research that shows a very clear link between alcohol, how tired someone is during the day, and their grade point average. Uh, different studies showed the link between heavy drinking and GPA, but I think notably at research universities, students who are engaged in binge drinking or heavy episodic drinking, drinking a lot in a short amount of time, um, often defi defined as five in a row for men, four in a row for women, are less likely to be engaged in interactions with faculty. Research by AAC, AAC and U has shown that that engagement is an important predictor of retention. Um, really, uh, again, so many things around academic success. And frequency of binge drinking is associated with lower grades. 
When you ask students, though, hey, what gets in the way of your academic success? They don't tend to say partying. Uh, this is from the same National College Health Assessment. These are the top 10 things identified by students, and you'll note substance use doesn't show up on this. Number one thing students endorse, stress. Number two, sleep problems. Number three, anxiety. I think noteworthy is that a lot of things that people might do around substances could either cause those very problems or certainly could exacerbate them. So as I talk a bit about, again, intervention and prevention, we, there's a real opportunity that students see these as hooks. Um, getting sick all the time in fourth place, having a job outside of school. Um, the fastest growing category has been the internet use or computer games, uh, special, especially time spent on social networking sites. Um, depression, concern for a trouble friend or family member, doing extracurricular things, or having relationship difficulties. So when we look at um, our opportunities from a prevention standpoint, this is something I'm sure you've all seen before, and it was adapted from the Institute of Medicine. Um, to me, it's always important to remind myself of this. Along the top are the consequences associated with a person's use. Along the bottom are the strategies that we can use in response to those consequences. What often gets lost in the shuffle is that the majority of students on our campus, at other campuses, are on the left. Either they don't drink, or if they do, do so in a way that has no to mild problems associated with their use. These are the folks for whom primary prevention tend to be indicated. I think a lot of colleges see the value in that. A lot of colleges definitely are saying, what can we offer our students who have substance use disorders or who are struggling? The folks who have moderate to severe problems, these are the people for whom specialized treatment might be indicated. Um, this next slide I was going to not show, but I was reminded of this in December. Um, Clayton Neighbors, a colleague of ours that's now at the University of Houston, uh, the two of us had a chance to do a presentation at the Stanwood School District, north of Seattle. We put up this slide, and one of the prevention specialists raised his hand. He said, I've been cursed by primary prevention. And we're like, really? You know, seems like a weird thing to be cursed by. Like vampires? I get that. But um, primary prevention, we're like, why do you say that? And he says, I'll be right back. If I hadn't seen the box of proof, I'm not sure I would have believed his story. Classic primary prevention, of course, attempts to delay the onset of use, uh, keep abstainers abstaining, or have whatever use is happening, keep it from progressing any further. And while we can see that on college campuses, classic primary prevention we see with younger kids. He was asked by the superintendent to put a drug prevention message in the hand of every kid first through fifth grade. And he's like, that's a challenge. What could I even do? And he's like, wait, little kids are learning how to write cursive. They're telling stories on those really big sheets of paper that are half a picture in three lines. So he ordered thousands of pencils that said, friends don't let friends do drugs. And they were a hit. Total hit. The kids loved them. The kids got the pencils, they liked the pencils, they used and sharpened the pencils, and they wound up with little friends do drugs pencils. Uh, he said the first time he walked by an eight-year-old with a friends do drugs pencil, he was like, uh, we're going to need to get all those pencils back. So uh, they ordered mechanical pencils for the little kids, and first graders, they're like, can't use, and they're just shooting lead everywhere. So he was right. He was cursed by primary prevention. Um, the research that I've had a chance to be a part of and our, what I spend most of my time trying to bring to UW students is in the middle. What if people have made the choice to drink and they've experienced some mild to moderate consequences? These are the people for whom brief interventions would be indicated. Now, the good news is, is when we look at what works, we as a field have come a long, 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 long way. If you go back to 25 years ago, honestly, if you look at randomized control trials with behavioral outcomes, um, with longitudinal follow-up, there were none. There were no um, published studies looking at the efficacy of different intervention and prevention efforts. What we did have were 12,000 just say no clubs. Um, come a long way. And um, in all of these different publications, you start seeing a lot of the, uh, the work that really highlights um, what does seem to be effective. Um, the one that I'll talk briefly about, uh, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, NIAAA, commissioned a group of scientists, two of whom are sitting right there, uh, to review the literature on what works in impacting college student drinking. Much of what we found actually works in individually focused approaches come from the uh, papers and the reviews done by Mary Larimer and Jessica Kruntz. Um, and they really said, you know, let's look at this from a three-in-one framework. What type of approaches target individuals? What ones target the student body as a whole? And what approaches target the college and the surrounding community? And they said, let's put them in four different tiers of effectiveness. What works in impacting college student drinking? What works with the general adult population that we could try in a college setting but still needs to be studied? What has logical and theoretical promise and just needs to be studied further? And what just didn't work? 
And interestingly, in tier four, there were a couple of things. One was fact only, information only, values clarification only programs delivered in a vacuum. Um, at best, you'll see an increase in knowledge, no change in behavior. The other thing that flat out didn't work was live instantaneous breathalyzer feedback. Um, some people said, what if students don't realize how intoxicated they are? What if we go to a party and we're like, come here, man. Let me have you blow a breathalyzer and we'll show you how impaired you are with the hope that this would make someone say, wow, I had no idea. But instead, it deteriorates to, you know, you versus me. Whoever blows the highest BAC wins. And people would come up like the third and fourth time and be like, try me now. And um, <laughs> that was a good impression. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, and they certainly found that that backfired. When you look at the list of what works, in some ways it was an underwhelming list of only three things. The cool thing, the three things have a lot of science supporting them. The good thing for someone who has a lot of Husky pride, all three things were developed, implemented, and evaluated at the University of Washington. Um, the very first thing, combining cognitive behavioral skills with norms clarification and motivational enhancement interventions. That's a mouthful there, and I'll, I'll do what I can to describe that bullet a bit more closely. But the one program mentioned by name as an example, the Alcohol Skills Training Program, uh, developed by Alan Marlat and his team in the late 80s, offering brief motivational enhancement interventions, the only program mentioned by name, Brief Alcohol Screening and Intervention for College Students, uh, Basics, also developed by Alan Marlat in the early 90s, and Challenging Alcohol Expectancies. The early research on that was done, um, again, by Alan Marlat. Uh, Jack Darkus and Mark Goldman at South Florida uh, provided most of the studies mentioned in that point. Just to say a bit about the skills, norms clarification, and motivation enhancement. The norms clarification part is important. We find that among the things that can predict college students drinking is their perception of what's going on around them. Since the 40s, we've known that you know, people are influenced by their subjective interpretation of a situation rather than what's really going on. If we walk into a room or an event, it seems kind of sketchy, and we're like, I'm going to get out of here, we're leaving, whether it was sketchy or not. It's our take on it that impacts our behavior. We're, we're influenced as well by our perception of what other people think, their behaviors, their expectations, rather than by their actual. And science shows our perceptions and interpretations are often inaccurate. Um, Alan Berkowitz and Wes Perkins in the late 80s did the most to help shed light on this from a college student standpoint. They found that students tend to overestimate the acceptability of excessive behavior. In other words, they think that other people are far more okay with really excessive stuff than they really are. Um, but when we look at attitudes, those are referred to as injunctive norms. The, the other part, though, we know a bit more what to do with interventions, and those include the descriptive norms. Students tend to think that more people drink than really do, and that those that do drink, drink more than they actually do. Maybe an incoming freshman thinks that everyone drinks, and they all drink eight on a Friday. That person might drink six, because they don't want to be as bad as everyone else. Um, there's research that shows that if you can correct a misperceived norm, not for everyone, but for some, it will go down. You know, when you look at why this misperception happens, it's kind of how we work as people. My favorite description of this, Jeff Linkenbach at Montana State, highlights the fact, um, you know, take it out of drinking. If you're driving on the interstate for half an hour and there's no, you know, crazy traffic conditions, there's no backups, um, so apparently you're out at 3 um, in the morning. Um, in 30 minutes on I-5, what are the cars that really stand out to you and get your attention? What do people tend to say? People tend to say the fast ones, the ones weaving in and out of traffic. How many of those do we really see in those 30 minutes? Three, four, let's be crazy and say ten. What's the first thing when we say when we get out of the car? Everyone drives crazy around here, right? For whatever reason, we don't notice the hundreds of people doing exactly what we're doing. We notice the extreme, and we see the same thing happens with college students and drinking. At a party, they don't tend to notice the non-drinkers, the ones drinking a drink all night. They tend to notice the much more extreme stuff. And we know that that can, again, impact their own behavior. Um, I had the chance to do some research looking at uh, norm perception on marijuana use, and at the end I'll talk a bit about marijuana use. In a survey of almost 6,000 people, two-thirds of students, much like the national trends now, had never used marijuana. So if you asked, what does the typical student do? The right answer is, the typical student doesn't use. Only 2% of students got this right. 98% of people said, well, the typical student smokes weed, and they smoke weed at least once a year. Uh, we found that uh, the grosser the misperceptions, the more that was associated with someone's own use and the, uh, the, their own consequences associated with their use. The skills training part involves um, all of these types of different strategies. It involves setting limits. If you do make the choice to drink, going up to but not exceeding a certain blood alcohol level and taking steps to, to reduce the harms associated with drinking. Um, the motivational enhancement piece um, uh, 
literally uh, based on Bill Miller and Steve Rowling's motivational interviewing, all based on the idea that it's a non-judgmental, non-confrontational clinical pro approach. That when people are ambivalent, seeks to explore and resolve that ambivalence. It very much focuses on meeting people where they are in terms of their level of readiness to change. For people who, are, who aren't thinking about change, who are pre-contemplative, um, does what we can to try and prompt thinking about it or contemplation. For those that are contemplative or ambivalent, yeah, again, seeks to explore and resolve that ambivalence. The second, offering uh, brief motivational enhancement interventions. Um, the gold standard in this area is basics. Um, this is mainly a slide to uh, let you know that I learned how to use our scanner, so thank you very much. <laughs> Not even joking. Um, but uh, the basics book that came out in 99 um, highlights the fact that basics involved in alcohol screening. There was an in-person assessment. A student would go away and would self-monitor their behavior, and they would come back and get a personalized feedback sheet where the data from their assessment would be used to um, really highlight everything from types of blood alcohol levels the person attained, how long it takes them to sober up, things like that. And when going through the feedback, we'll review information and relevant skills training content. Um, the feedback doesn't have to be gorgeous. Um, this was, this was uh, literally the feedback from the very first basic study, um, the, a full four years after the intervention so showed changes in behavior. This was side one, this was side two. This program was done in WordPerfect for DOS, uh, and we actually had to hire a graphic designer to make that really big number one, that really big number two, and then that shadowy 94. Uh, and when that came out, we were like, that's amazing. Um, and then clip art came out, and we had to let her go. But um, the, uh, if you look at the components there, um, giving feedback on frequency quantity, blood alcohol level, norm perception, the consequences they've experienced, risks based on family history, alcohol dependence risks, um, their expectancies, and their own self-reported concern. In later studies, we still kept it at a page, but tried to make it look a little flashier. This was side one. This was side two. I showed you one slide uh, earlier today uh, where there was a typo, my favorite typo of all. I had the chance to reshow it to some of my colleagues in our center earlier this week. Uh, the hardest part of any study, as I'm sure you know, is coming up with an acronym for it. And this, was a, this project was called the Motivating Campus Change Project, MC Squared. We were so thrilled with that title, except that little superscript became very, very challenging over the course of the project because we learned that not everyone had a program that let them make that little too. Uh, one of our sites on this project, I used to work at another college, where uh, one day I was walking into the office and I'm like, are you serious? How long has that been there? The sign that was the directory for our building, I'll show you, uh, it speaks louder than words. Here's a picture of me in front of the sign, and it actually said, MC2, Bob, this should be squared, <laughs> motivating campus change. <laughs> Bob, the sign maker, didn't think very critically about the note that he had received. And... Uh, that was up for four years. You know, when they, when they redid the building, when they, <laughs> seriously, when they redid the building, I was like, I will pay whatever it takes to get that sign. And they actually gave it to me. And I have it at work now because my wife told me I had to get it out of our dining room. But uh, it's pretty phenomenal. But um, it gives, again, just as an example, this is an example of, uh, you can see graphically represented, this is this person's peak BAC compared to the average peak of their peers. Their typical BAC compared to their average of their peers. Uh, with, with no disservice meant to motivational interviewing, often um, you'll find that the feedback can, can serve to develop a discrepancy between what's a value and goal of importance to the person and where they're, what their behavior and the status quo might look like. Imagine the person says, I would never want to hurt anybody, so I never want to drink and drive. So I always stay the night at my friend's house and drive home the next day. This person's peak takes them 17 hours to get back to a zero. If they're at 0.27 at midnight, they're not blowing a zero till 5 in the afternoon the next day. If they drive any time before noon, they're above a 0.08. If they drive until 5, they still have a positive BAC. If the person goes, whoa, that's a discrepancy. And so that's where, again, the feedback can be used to prompt considering change. Um, the person has all these weight concerns, but they're getting this many calories from alcohol, things like that. And finally, challenging alcohol expectancies in one minute or less uh, Alan Marlott was credited with the development of the balanced placebo design. Prior to Alan's research, we certainly saw the left side. We could tell someone, we're going to give you a substance, either give it to them or give them a placebo. He took it a step further to say, what if we tell people we're giving them, you know, not the substance, but for some, in fact, give them none, for others, we actually give it to them. Um, was able to uh, recruit people for a range of different studies where in the consent, it said at some point over the course of the study, you may be served alcohol. 
once people signed on to that, um, it set the stage for being able to randomize people to these conditions and take a look at what happens. To make sure that there's real world validity and it can generalize to the real world, um, if you have the chance to be in our psych department, Guthrie Hall, room 242 from the outside, looks like a regular class. On the inside, Alan built a bar. Um, this is called the Bar Lab, the Behavioral Alcohol Research Laboratory. Uh, great for studying behavior, the mirror to a mirror. The Dos Equis sign above the mirror is the Dos Equis camera, area where the two X's intercept, uh, is in fact a, a, a hollowed out. There's six microphones on the ceiling. And what we find is people that are told they're getting alcohol, even when they don't, all the great social stuff people say they get from drinking happens. Um, they get more funny, they get more, the lower left-hand corner, more funny, more outgoing, more talkative, more flirty. Um, people who don't know they're drinking, even when they do, the physiological effects of alcohol kick in. No changes in social things, but the attributions people make, they're what they're feeling, um, uh, you know, have less to do with what they consume than they're just trying to make sense of what's happening. It's a depressant, so they get tired, and they're like, wow, I had a long day today. They flush, and they attribute it to being too hot. They get clumsy, and they're like, sorry and just clean up and try not to cause any more trouble. So the research shows that the mere act of going through an expectancy challenge leads to people cutting down on their drinking. So the top two showed reductions in drinking and consequences. The bottom, reductions in drinking. Um, that came out again in 2002. I know that we're excited that later this year, NIAAA is uh, releasing a matrix of programs. It's going to be the first truly major update since the 2002 report. They did a brief update in 2007, but this they're going to do a major launch for. Uh, I feel very lucky to be one of the six contributors to this. Um, and it's going to be a, th a thorough review of environmental approaches, policies, prevention programs, intervention programs, other approaches arranged as a grid, um, which sounds less cool than the matrix, but arranged as a grid of programs so things like cost, effectiveness, implementation needs can be considered. The good news, we have these things that work. The less good news, Tobin Nelson did a survey of college administrators and asked, what have you done since the NIAAA task force report came out? One in five administrators said, what NIAAA task force report? People didn't know about it. And overall, of the schools that did, only about half offered empirically supported intervention programs. The others were still offering things that were perhaps in that tier four or evidence of ineffectiveness. So the question is, if we have these things that can work, what can we do to bring these um, to college campuses and really translate science to practice better? Um, uh, Mary Larimer, uh, Christine Lee, and I had the chance to work on a paper that included a review of the different barriers to implementing evidence-based approaches. Rogers identified four domains in which barriers can exist. Dissemination, adoption, implementation, and maintenance. Around dissemination, um, so, uh, the Sobels actually pointed out that published findings often appear in journals that are not oriented to clinicians. And when they are, often there's a little description of the steps needed to apply a treatment or intervention. So a lot of that, I mean, it's, it's on us. Obviously, when we're looking at where to publish things, the question is, are there other forms? Are there other outlets? For still making sure the science gets out there and gets in the hands of the people who are most uniquely positioned to make a difference on the clients that they're working with. Um, additionally, some publications or evaluations aren't very user-friendly. If, if there's a, a publication that talked about a log transformation of data, and a clinician saying, well, yeah, but what does that mean in terms of how many drinks fewer are my clients going to experience? Um, some of that can become challenging as well. Um, barriers to adoption include reactions from key individuals involved in the process. If you get one person who strongly feels we should go this way or that way, that can make a big difference. Um, diversity of opinion about how to proceed could lead to difficulty in committing to a program. Um, unreasonable expectations. So if we do this one program, this basics thing, underage drinking will go away? Well, probably not. Um, but if, that, if, if, if they're going to dismiss then the program is a failure, if drinking still happens, that's a problem. Um, it's an insufficient buy-in. Um, you know, we know so importantly about the importance of not only fidelity in delivering interventions, but the importance of when a program comes in, having the infrastructure in place to give it a chance to succeed. So related to that buy-in, not enough time working with directors, administrators, staff, or students. Barriers to implementation include proper training of those delivering a program. We have a lot of great programs, but to me, it's a research question to determine what are the best practices for actually um, um, training in these different domains. Plus, there's a tendency to reinvent innovations. That's fine. That's where the greatest you know, advances have come from. But it's recognizing that if you tweak something too much, it might no longer be an empirically supported approach anymore. Um, 
I remember getting a phone call from someone that said, we're doing this really cool project where we're doing basics for gay men who use ecstasy. And I'm like, that's a great brief intervention, but the A in basic stands for alcohol and the CS stands for college students. So if you're doing a brief intervention for ecstasy, cool. But um, it, it's tough to now call that basics anymore. And so um, uh, we definitely see that that can be uh, an issue. Uh, also related implementation, organizational factors, including resources, issues impacting effective de delivery, real world things that can get in the way, um, attitudes among leaders, resistance among staff familiar and comfortable with a prior approach um, can be an issue as well. And then finally, related to maintenance, issues again of fidelity, therapist drift. Um, we can train people in motivational interviewing. The question is, a year later, a month later, are they still doing that? Uh, and that highlights the need for ongoing assessment and continued training. To me, the good news is there are absolutely ways to overcome these barriers. And um, I'll talk a bit about what some of those are. So in trying to identify some of the strategies for overcoming barriers and then bridging this gap between science and practice, um, one of these includes screening. We have so many good empirically supported approaches and the question is how can we get another human being across from us to be able to deliver that? Where there started being some real love for the idea of screening was recognizing that there is such an opportunity to just catch people early. I love this quote. On responding to student mental health issues, the statement, the solution lies in being aware of it, intervening earlier, and providing support with adequate and appropriate services. Kind of why, I mean, I love this quote because I think it's, I agree with this completely. Part of why I like this quote as well is this has nothing to do with the United States. This came from uh, two clinicians at a, research, at a college in Turkey. Um, this isn't a U.S. issue. This is literally a global issue. And so it's how can we intervene earlier with people? Um, we know there are folks slipping through the cracks. Wu and colleagues um, looked at the uh, 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 National Survey of Drug Use and Health from SAMHSA and found that the past year prevalence, much like the NISARC data set showed, is about one in five. Twelve and a half percent of college students met past year criteria for abuse. 8.1 percent met past year criteria for dependence. You can see the rates for drug abuse as well. However, when they, when they then asked, you know, did you receive any services of any kind, the numbers are grim. Only 3.9% of full-time college students with an alcohol use disorder receive anything. Without being dramatic and flipping it, let me be dramatic and flip it. 96% get nothing. And so, especially in the case of dependence, which is a lifetime diagnosis, it's what could we do. The other issue, though, is that they're not beating down the door to ask for help. Um, only 2.4% of those who screened positive and didn't receive services perceived a need for services. One of the challenges, again, in developing discrepancies is some of the folks that actually um, have experienced a consequence, whether it's cognitive dissonance, whether it's just how we protect ourselves, don't seem that worried sometimes about a risk down the road. Um, a study I had the chance to do uh, with Christine Lee, um, we looked at folks that were using marijuana and 43% of people that have used marijuana experienced a past year academic consequence. We asked those folks, how likely is it that you would experience an academic consequence in the future? We also asked that same question to abstainers. Abstainers were afraid. 71% of abstainers said, if I started using marijuana, it would absolutely affect my academics. But only 20% of those that were already using perceived risk for a future academic consequence. 35% of marijuana users experienced a past year social consequence. Only 9% perceived risk for a future risk compared to 55% of abstainers. So going back to this idea of um, their perceived need, for whatever reason, there might be a challenge. The good news is interventions that are motivational interviewing based are a great fit for folks that might be pre-contemplative. Ralph Hinkson at NIAAA pointed out that many of these conversations may not even be happening. Um, he did a study where the only criteria for inclusion is, have you had a drink in the last year? He then looked at a subset that had seen a physician in the last year and asked, did that physician ask you about your drinking? And if so, what, what conversations did you have? Only 14% of those exceeding low-risk drinking guidelines were asked and advised about risky drinking by their physician. The age group most likely to exceed it, 18 to 25 year olds. And they were the ones least often asked about this. So that's where we started realizing if we do more screening, there's an opportunity. Um, I feel lucky that I had the chance to be project faculty for the National um, College Depression Partnership. National College Depression Partnership, what came out of New York University, uh, Michael Klein and Henry Chung. And they said, we know that students that might slip through the cracks for depression um, nevertheless use other health services. They want flu shots. They have a sore throat and they want to know if they have strep throat. 
They want to know if they can get, you know, um, medication for something. So they said, someone comes in because their hand hurts, depression screen. They want a flu shot, depression screen. And the project showed they were able to capture uh, a huge subset of students that otherwise would have slipped through, slipped through the cracks and showed that screening, follow-up, and connecting people to outcomes-based treatment resulted in improved clinical outcomes. For alcohol, other studies have looked at this as well. I'm project faculty for the National College Health Improvement Project out of uh, Dartmouth College, where many schools are doing this as well. You come to the health center for whatever reason, take the audit, or the audit C, or the NIAAA single screening question. Mike Fleming at Northwestern, Jim Schaus at Central Florida, have shown clearly that this can have an impact, so much so that Ralph Hinkson said the efficacy of screening and brief motivational interventions in health centers, we don't have to debate can this work. It's been established. And he suggests that more screening and interventions in health services could ultimately achieve population level benefits because we'll ultimately connect more people to empirically supported approaches than we would if we um, had people self-select toward these. So screening, definitely one possibility. The other is very strategic and intentional outreach. Without spending too much time talking about the other part of my job, I mentioned that I work in health and wellness. And health and wellness was set up uh, from the office of the vice president and vice provost for student life um, after a range of very traumatic and, and very uh, devastating things happened uh, across the nation. The shooting at Virginia Tech, uh, the shooting that happened on our own campus. And it was part of the idea of reducing the likelihood of students slipping through the cracks. Um, if a student was on our radar for any reason, a police report, a report from an RA in the residence halls or an RD, faculty, um, health care providers, we reach out to the student and offer a meeting to check in with them. This is not judicial. This is not conduct. We're not the counseling center. Um, but it literally is this chance to reduce the likelihood of people slipping through the cracks. For me, related to substance use, if I've got a student who's over 21, lives off campus, but a police report comes through, um, through conjunction with Seattle Police and UW Police that a UW student was transported here to Harborview. Um, they were off campus, they're legal. Nevertheless, if I get that report within 24 hours, I reach out to that student and say, heard you had a rough weekend, want to check in and see how you're doing. For conduct, there would never be this reason. Um, again, for judicial, would never be this reason. Once students meet with us, we can determine how things are going, what's going well, maybe what's going less well, and what services can be available to them. I'll say again, it's different than judicial. They're not in trouble when they meet with us. And can provide outreach in ways that for a range of reasons are different than the counseling center might be able to do. What we can do is without being counseling, if through a brief conversation or a brief intervention the person's interested in change, it can be used to facilitate a referral to counseling. Only because it's what's published on our website, um, rather than show the most recent data, the, the, the things that are on the OVPSL website from 2009 to 2010, 28 students that we would have had no other reason to intervene with during that academic year involved in an AOD incident were able to uh, meet with me, get connected to get a sense of how things were going, and when needed, connect them to uh, evidence-based treatment, relapse prevention, or other services. We were able to, for students that violated policy when they, when they were in trouble, um, through a partnership between the Department of Psychology and Student Life, provide group interventions and assessments for up to 300 students that, again, otherwise probably, especially if you look at what's at other schools, would not have gotten connected with these empirically supported approaches. Um, other evidence-based approaches to over 2,000 students. Um, addressing co-occurring issues. You know, I think that a lot of times this can be very, very challenging, but the more we're aware of the fact that these issues don't occur in a vacuum, the better. Some people get really nervous about the notion of, oh, wait, 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 they're coming to see me about their depression. Can I really talk with them about their alcohol? Yes, sometimes it needs to be forced, um, as evidenced by this picture. These are two kids wearing the We Will Get Along shirt, which I'm pretty sure is bad parenting, but I think it's a funny picture. So, um, and little brother seems way more excited about this than older sister does. So like, I don't like you guys. Um, uh, when you look at addressing mental health and AOD needs, the nice thing about addressing these together is it attends to multiple needs of the student and can be sensitive to context. I think that's important. Maybe the reason why someone's drinking is to cope with depression, self-medicating. Maybe the reason why they're depressed is all these horrible things that happened when they've been drinking. Um, some of the research that I think is so related to the real-world struggles that our students are experiencing um, is work that Melissa Lewis has been doing, looking at um, alcohol-related sexual consequences, negative affect after hooking up and regretting that. Um, that is absolutely what we're seeing. And so I think that looking at the fact that if we attend to, you know, um, 
improving their mood, we might be missing the substance use issues that are going on and vice versa. Um, I like the idea that it can reduce the barrier on access to services. If someone comes in and we're like, oh, you have a drinking problem here, I'm going to need to refer you to this place. If we can do it under the same roof, the likelihood of connecting people, engaging them, and making an impact is there. We know we can routinely screen for both issues. After the National College Depression Partnership showed we could do this for depression, they started doing research that looked at um, implementing it for alcohol as well, and even anxiety as well. We know that many successful interventions and prevention efforts already are effective for both alcohol and mental health issues. Um, I think that if we do more addressing these co-occurring issues and evaluate them, we could help advance and promote research on best practices in this area. Plus, because both domains can have such a significant impact on campus, any steps to address both, address both can impact the community. Um, there are challenges, though. I think that we know from very recent research, we still need to do more to bridge the gap and advance the science on best practices related to co-occurring issues. Um, students might present ready to work on their depression, but not their drinking, or vice versa. Uh, I think there's different states of research on prevention. We've got some really good um, prevention approaches for alcohol. Um, we're maybe less there. We have good treatments for depression, but learning more about how we can uh, do some work on, on uh, even early intervention or prevention for depression as well. Irene Geisner in our lab has done very cool work looking at web-based um, personalized feedback for not only depression, but her recent research looking at these co-occurring issues as well. And then finally, overcoming barriers to students' access and care. I'll get the chance later this month to be at the University of Michigan's depression conference. Um, since Michigan's not depressing in February. And um, uh, Dan Eisenberg there uh, did a study screening students for depression. The students that flagged for depression um, asked them, do you think you need help? 72% um, of the students that flagged felt like they needed help, but only 36% got help. When he looked at the barriers to not getting help, it included, believe it or not, the number one barrier was students didn't know what help was available. That's fixable. It kills me when I meet a senior who's like, we have a counseling center? It's like, really? Um, but that's a barrier, and we can fix that. Students not knowing what would be covered if they did go. Students questioning, well, how helpful can this really be? That's on us, I think. A lot of that's on us to do more education about how therapy can be used, how different treatment approaches can be used, how to get connected with those, very, very important as well. Um, and then finally, what happens when practice gets ahead of research? I think we're seeing that right now. Um, the state of Washington in November, the voters um, passed Initiative 502, which legalized marijuana for recreational purposes. And suddenly, um, we've, we've not only seen a clinical need, but the, the, we're having to make some decisions where we would normally turn to, well, let's see what the science says, and the science isn't there yet. Um, again, big changes in Washington. This has not been photoshopped. This is a real picture of Seattle from Thursday, December 6th, the day that possession of marijuana for recreational purposes has been legal. Um, <laughs> Pretty sure those are clouds. I hope those are clouds. Um, but uh, welcome to our future. No, joking, joking aside, um, at the University of Washington, especially for students who are violating alcohol policy, we had good programs in place. And they were evidence-based programs. But what happens when people get in trouble for marijuana? So I was like, well, let's look at the science. Um, there was a clear need for a group for mandated students. And there was, when you look at the literature, there is no tier one intervention. For tier one, you needed multiple studies with, again, randomized, uh, randomization of condition, a control group, follow-up, and behavioral outcomes. So I was like, all right, well, what else can we learn from the NIAAA task force report? There was that tier two. What worked with the general adult population? We knew that motivation enhancement-based approaches worked with college students for alcohol, and we knew that motivation enhancement-based groups can impact drug use for the general adult population. So there was a marijuana and other drug workshop um, that I developed using the alcohol skills training program as a model. Obviously, there's a chance to collect pilot data, but this is a case where we can at least see, is it a step in the right direction? So using a measure that the Addictive Behaviors Research Center, the Center for the Study of Health and Risk Behaviors had used in the past, um, there was the foresight about 10 years ago, I think, to include a survey immediately after the intervention that got at, um, are you thinking differently about your use right now? Do you have an intent to change? And do you have a specific goal in mind about changing your behavior? The beauty of asking that immediately after an intervention is we could follow people over time and say, did the folks that said they would change, do they? And while there are, of course, exceptions, for the most part, yes, they do. So while ideally behavioral outcomes would be preferred, I've been able to give that same survey to see if the workshop, in quotes, performs like a motivation enhancement-based group should. 
So the marijuana and other drug uh, program involves eliciting from the students the good things and the not so good things about their marijuana use. Where applicable, I can bring in what the science says about what consequences the students have identified. Also where applicable, highlight ways in which these not so good things can be reduced or eliminated. The key, I elicit from the students what would make some of those unwanted effects happen less often. And then where relevant, review other substances when it's, in, uh, again, noteworthy or of interest to the students. Um, a quick detour to talk about consequence measures, because what we also learned is that perhaps we'll see better advances in the study around drug program evaluation if we get better at the methodology. Um, one of the projects that has been the most enjoyable if you may have a, a chance to work on, Christine Lee uh, was PI for a project where we looked at an individualized first-line feedback program for marijuana. And in part of that, we started looking at consequence measures and realized that most of the college student marijuana consequence measures took an alcohol measure and just substituted the word marijuana for it. The Rutgers Alcohol Problem Index from Helene White, gold standard in our field, they made the Rutgers Marijuana Problem Index, which literally substituted the words. Um, and we started feeling that might not adequately capture the experiences of the students. So particularly important and wanted to capture those things, um, we had 207 students that used uh, marijuana pretty frequently to list up to five of the not so good things they'd experienced because of their marijuana use. We had 805 separate effects identified and we were able to code those into making uh, a measure. When you look at the top 10, um, what gives me some hope during prevention and a changing legal climate is note that in the top 10 it being illegal wasn't on the list. So students say the things I don't like about marijuana had less to do with its illicit status. Um, eating and eating too much Students for whom body image is a big issue, you'll hear students say, I work out a lot, and when I get really high, I eat stuff that I would normally not eat, and I eat more of it than I would normally eat. Sleep problems, getting st motivation issues, attention or concentration, memory, problems with lungs or coughing, feeling antisocial or experiencing social awkwardness, other physical difficulties. Draw that line after eight. What's noteworthy is the top eight did not appear on the Rutgers Marijuana Problem Index. Um, and that's not a criticism of that measure. In fact, Helene has been a great tag team partner for us as we've moved forward on this. But only ninth and 10th place showed up on that. So we're excited to see, as we start to include this in other measures, might we as a field get better at detecting reductions in consequences? Oh, I wanted to show you too. Among the other consequences, people describe some pretty severe stuff. Here's a sign, lost unicorn. If found, please stop doing drugs. Which, <laughs> seriously, if you see that, you gotta back off. Um, <laughs> So this measure was developed and compared responses from the 18-item Rutgers Marijuana Problem Index. The main thing I'll highlight is that 85% of a sample of 410 students use marijuana at least once listed three or more consequences with our measure. Only about 57% uh, listed three or more consequences on the RMPI. You'll note that number of consequences were more than double. It's not that we're trying to make things look bad, it's that we're trying to better capture what the students are experiencing. So um, those consequences um, I think as we get better at experiencing the harms, that's going to have clear implications for what we can do in brief motivational interventions looking to find a hook. And I know we're excited to test that with non-college samples as well. So back from the detour, what the Marijuana and Other Drug Workshop showed from the last academic year. With 54 completers, these were mandated students told, you have to go meet with this guy for two, two 90-minute sessions. Um, it blows my mind that 89% of them said um, the information I receive will cause me to think differently about my pattern of use. I fully get that's not behavior change yet, but that's contemplation. The fact that 7.5% are undecided is still okay because that means they're ambivalent. 4% of them are like, uh, I'm not listening to that guy in the sweater vest. Um, <laughs> when you look at intent to change, thank you. Uh, when you look at intent to change, the information I receive will cause me to change my pattern of use. 40% agree. 45% undecided. Again, from where I'm sitting, when we look at how motivational enhancement programs perform, I still see that as a success. Leaving with a specific goal in mind, less agree, and that's okay because for marijuana we have less clear guidelines for ways to use in a less risky way. So now that two years of post-intervention surveys have been collected in a collaboration with Dolores Cimini at SUNY Albany, we're going to be able to take a look at some behavioral outcomes as well, um, continue to incorporate some of the new science into our conversations with students, um, figure out for those who do change why, and further look at strategies for reducing harm. So in wrapping up, um, I'm so in love with this quote. I had the chance to, for a talk I gave in October, um, reviewing uh, uh, older literature, found this quote from George Miller in his presidential address to the APA in 1969. 
I can imagine nothing we could do that would be more relevant to human welfare and nothing that could pose a greater challenge to the next generation of psychologists than to discover how to best give psychology away. I love that idea, and I feel like when I look at my friends and colleagues who do so much of the real-world stuff that absolutely makes a difference, that's what this involves. It's translating, you know, Deb Kaysen's work internationally um, comes to mind for me always. You know, it's, it's taking things from a journal that someone might not ever see and translating it in a way that gives psychology away. When we talk about cutting-edge science and make sure that our clients or patients are hearing about that in a way that means something to them, we're giving psychology away. And so, to me, as far as future directions, the opportunity to figure out what does that look like and how do we do that best? How do we best give psychology away? I do think the opportunity to continue to build bridges between research and practice. I feel lucky that I'm a school that lets me coexist in these two worlds. Uh, I'm far too often reminded that I'm one of the only ones that have a setup like that, but it's, I hope that becomes less rare. I hope more people have the chance to be just as involved with the research as they do with the chance to immediately try and bring that research to the population they work with. Um, increased opportunities for collaboration between those conducting the science and those implementing services. I truly believe we have as much to learn from the folks using the programs we're developing as, as hopefully they might from us, but I, I think that's really important as well. Examining best practices in training. People ask us all the time, well, how long is the best basics training? Good question. It's a good empirical question, and we hope to look at that at some point. Um, we have more people in college, fall 2012, than ever before. And with an increasingly diverse student body on college campuses, examining cultural adaptations of evidence-based approaches, I think, also very important, especially as we bridge the gap between science and practice. Um, considering emerging technology for data collection to more immediately capture student experiences. We can reduce the lag between some real-world things and, and how we're capturing those. And part of that could also be opportunities related to and the impact of social networking sites. Um, to end on a hopeful, uh, hopefully a, a light note on a Friday, uh, my final slide is a, is a joke slide. Um, I, uh, I'll, I'll re-show you slides I showed at the uh, Research Society on Alcoholism Conference in June of 2011. Um, I made reference to Deb's work, Deb's uh, PI on, uh, on a project where we recruited the largest sample of its kind um, following women who identify as lesbian and bisexual over time to look at different health and protective factors. And I was presenting um, the methodology behind that and how we use Facebook to recruit um, this sample. And Deb had said, you know, you should do something funny about our topic. I'm like, we don't have a very funny topic. <laughs> She's like, well, if you're, if you're admitting to losing, and I'm like, game on. So uh, I had seen something go around the internet that showed the history of the world as seen through the eyes of Facebook. And I'm like, well, I'm a psychology nerd. I know this stuff. So I decided for the folks at RSA to, uh, if, if Facebook existed in the early days of psychology, it would have looked something like this. Pavlov, gonna go feed my dog today, should be epic. <laughs> Pavlov's dog likes this. <laughs> Pavlov, not cool, stupid dog drooled all over my Ikea rug. Seriously? Eat over your bowl, dog. Pavlov, dog, you hope that's true. <laughs> Pavlov, dude, are you posting on Facebook? How'd you learn to do that? Skinner taught me. <laughs> BF Skinner likes this. <laughs> Pavlov, well, rats. Skinner, hey, did someone say rats? I'm running out of stuff to do with the me box. So bored. Pavlov's dog, yeah, why are you saying rats? I'd say the whole situation could have been classy. Cool. <laughs> That's it. I'll give you something to drool about. Where's my bell? I need help. I'm calling mom. Freud, whoa, saw that coming. <laughs> Pavlov's dog, LOL. So uh, I was asked to stop it with 10 minutes to go. I hit that perfectly. So I very much appreciate the uh, invitation and the chance to do this. Uh, definitely want to acknowledge uh, NIDA and NIAAA for their support of our work. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually wanted to list all the folks I work with at C-Shrub, uh, but that wouldn't have fit on my slides. But um, tried to anyone that directly helped with this, tried to make sure I, I thanked you, and I'm, I'm sorry if I missed anybody. But um, truly feel both lucky and honored to get the chance to do what I do at a campus that means so much to me. And um, I really do think that uh, if, if you look at this idea of bridging the gap, a lot of us are doing this in our day-to-day -day work. There is a science behind that. But um, as far as we've come, we also know that there's, there's places we can still go. So thank you all for your interest in this. I will see what questions people have, and then we'll go about our day. So thank you. Very, very much. You wanted me to pull up the uh, website, right? Okay. Questions from folks? Or comments? Either one. Go ahead. I was wondering how those 28 people 
28 students that had that were identified at being mm -hmm. at risk when you called them, what was their response? Like, I have all these pres these presumptions of what their response was, and I was wondering what it was. I will knock on wood to avoid jinxing myself. I've, not, I've never had someone say, no thanks, all's good. Um, we make very clear, it's not, it's not a threatening or scary. Um, a lot of times I'll try and call. If I can't reach them, um, I'll email. And I just say, you know, um, as part of my job, I'm notified when there's something that, uh, you know, a police report comes through that involves a UW student. I receive such a report. I just want to check in and see how you're doing. So it's worded that way. It's not, I have to meet with you. Um, and everyone responded. Knock on wood, batting a thousand. It's great. I mean, I do think that there's this window of opportunity. And again, to me, on the one hand, we have a big campus and it's like 28. Yeah, but it's 28 people that would have had no other reason to be connected and would have very likely have slipped through the cracks. We know that among the biggest predictors of pretty big injury is having had a previous pretty big injury. And so the window of opportunity for folks that are struggling to connect them with care when they would have otherwise not had that opportunity has, has been there. So thank you for your question. What other questions do people have? I think we should go eat all the, oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Go ahead. I'm curious about the efforts that are being directed towards community and private practitioners, bringing folks into the fold, um, thinking about the privileged state of students within the university, that there's mm -hmm. a, you know, a huge number of students outside Bless you. of the academy that would fall into this age group that you. aren't going to be eligible for services <coughs> for screening per se. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things, so part of my job also involves trying to, on a, bless you, on a community level, trying to make that impact. As part of being the chair on the College Coalition, I sit uh, once a month on the Reducing Underage Drinking Coalition in Olympia, which is, um, includes everything from low-income health care to work we do in high schools to, to you name it. Part of the, the state got from SANSA um, a strategic prevention enhancement grant, and that's exactly what we're looking at, is for the folks that aren't on a college campus, how are we reaching the ones not in college? How are we reaching the ones that um, have no health care? And I'm part of, um, for the SPE, I'm part of monthly meetings on that, and for RUAD, part of monthly meetings on that. And it's a chance, you know, I make very, very clear, I'm not trying to be the voice of science by any means, though, though I'd like that title, but um, <laughs> they, they'll often say, do you know what the science says about how to reach this age group or that age group? And so it's um, through my involvement in those, it's a chance to try and at least look at other opportunities like that as well. Um, I've made very clear you know, um, when I give the chance, I live in Olympia despite working in Seattle. If I have the chance to do um, trainings in my community, I do that as part of giving back to the community in which I live. And so a lot of that we do try and, you know, make sure we're arming folks in different venues with that as well. Good question. Go ahead. Um, about midway through your presentation, you had a percentage, um, a very low percentage of people who were asked about, I think it was alcohol or drug use right. in the yes. primary care setting. Mm -hmm. Do you know if that was an in-person question from the provider, mm -hmm. or it was one of those three or four sheets? Good question. In, in Ralph's study, they wanted to know, did it come up in conversation? Were you asked about it? Um, and so I'm sure we would see different data in terms of if, if it was tracked paper, pencil versus done in person. I know a lot of, um, you know, if it's done in paper, per, paper, pencil, the question is, did the provider even say, I noticed you put seven on a typical Friday. I'd like to ask you more about that. And so that very low percentage was that it's, it's not happening for, for a lot of folks. Um, Ralph's recent words suggested that, again, the hard part is, is the very age group most likely to exceed risky drinking were the ones least likely asked about it. So there's, I mean, we always say in harm reduction, any steps toward reduced risk are steps in the right direction. Any steps toward more screening we would think would be a step in the right direction. It's how that's done, though. I, I remember on one project, I was asked to tail medical providers just to give feedback on their screening. And I literally heard a provider ask students, you don't ever have more than three drinks, do you? And the do you says, don't say yes to that, right? And so working with them on asking that in a different way, tell me about your drinking. An abstainer will say, I don't drink. Um, when they say, oh, I never have more than three. Three what? Three mixed drinks. Uh, we, we, well, they might be having more than, than three, but um, yeah, Ralph's done some really cool work on that. We definitely have more, more we can do. I will loiter if there are any specific questions because I was told we have to be out of this room at 1. Plus, we all have to eat the spare cookies and chips. But uh, thank you all for the opportunity. I hope you have a good weekend. <laughs>